Today's episode of the Growing Readers podcast is brought to you by author PJ Davis. Coming up later in the show, we'll dive into Nemesis and the Vault of Lost Time, a gripping middle grade novel filled with suspense, adventure, and fantastical science. But first, let's jump into the episode. Approach people with curiosity rather than with assumptions and to sort of try and push back against the labels we might automatically assign to people when we see what they look like and uh, to really get to know them. Because I think that once we do get to know people on a deeper level, we find that they're more uh, like us than we might have initially thought. I'm Bianca Schultz of From the Children's Book Review, and this is the Growing Readers Podcast, where we dive deep into the world of literature and storytelling. Today's special guest joining us is the wonderful Andrea Wang, an award-winning author known for her captivating storytelling that explores themes of family, food, and culture. With a diverse range of picture books under her belt, including Magic Ramen and Watercress, which received the prestigious Caldecott Medal and Newbery Honor, Andrea has established herself as a prominent voice in children's literature. Her debut middle grade novel, The Many Meanings of Milan, has garnered widespread acclaim and was even featured on a recommended reading list from today's show, Read with Jenna. Andrea's writing beautifully weaves together narratives that resonate with readers of all ages, celebrating the richness of heritage, and the complexities of identity. Originally from Ohio and Boston, Andrea now calls Colorado home, where she continues to draw inspiration from her surroundings and her own experiences. Join us as we delve into her creative process and the impact she hopes her stories will have on young readers everywhere. Before I share our conversation, here's the synopsis for her newest middle grade book, Summer at Squee. From Newbery Honor-winning author Andrea Wang, a new middle-grade novel about a Chinese-American tween who attends a Boston-based Chinese cultural overnight camp and the many ways it transforms her. Feeny Fang plans to have the best summer ever. She's returning to summertime Chinese culture, wellness, and enrichment experience, S-C-C-W-E-E for short, and Squee to campus in the know. And this year... She's a senior camper. That means she, her best friend Lyrica Chu, and her whole squad will have the most influence. It almost doesn't matter that her brother is a CIT, counselor in training, and that her mom and auntie are the camp directors. Time spent at Squee is sacred, glorious, and free. On the day Feeny arrives, though, she learns that the squad has been split up and there's an influx of new campers this year. Feeney is determined to be welcoming and to share all the things she loves about camp. Who doesn't love spending hours talking about and engaging in cultural activities? But she quickly learns how out of touch she is with others' experiences, particularly of the campers who are adoptees. The same things that make her feel connected to her culture and community make some of the other campers feel excluded. Summer at Squee turns out to be even more transformative than Feeney could have imagined with new friends, her first crush, an epic show, and a bigger love for and understanding of her community. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the Growing Readers Podcast. Hi, Bianca. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, this is so fun. So I've met you a couple of times at some SCBWI events, but this is really the first time we kind of get to dive deep together into, you know, your writing and and your career and, of course, your latest book, Summer at Squee. I would love to just 
let everybody get to know you. What's one thing that you do in your day-to-day practices that you think would be the most surprising or it could be the most relatable, but just something that in, could inspire others or just demonstrate that they're not alone? Oh, one thing I started last year was to read a poem a day. I had been so busy with kids and the pandemic and writing and promo and everything that I had really stepped away from reading poetry on a regular basis. But last year I made an effort and it was so easy because there are many people who post a poem a day on Instagram and, you know, I would scroll through those and I've been looking through my own collection of books I've of poetry that I've collected over the years and reading those as well. And I just really love how it reminds me of the power and the beauty of language and what it can do. And I do feel like reading more poetry has influenced my own writing. Do you have something that you've already read for today or do you still need to go do that? My son, who is my new social media manager, posted a poem on my Instagram account today. And it is a poem by Pablo Neruda that I came across when I was in college. And it is really one of my favorites. It gave me a lot of hope in college. So... Okay, awesome. What's your what's your um, Instagram handle so everyone can go go read your poem for today? It's Andrea A N D R E A and the word Y W H Y and my last name Wang W A N G. So A N D R E A W H Y W A N G. Awesome. My yeah. middle initial is the letter Y, and I just decided to be like cutesy (laughs) and type it out as a word because I'm a very curious person. (laughs) Uh, I love that. I love that. Well, to be a writer, they say that you must be a reader first. Some people agree with that. Some people don't. But I want to know if there was a pivotal moment in which you did consider yourself a reader. I actually learned to read really early on, thanks to Sesame Street. And my mother used to say that Uh, She she used to tell a story that I came into the kitchen one day when I was a toddler and pointed to the loaf of bread on the counter and spelled it out, you know, the word bread and then read it to her. And she was just sort of astounded. And I was like, oh, I, I guess that means I can read. And then later in kindergarten, I remember my teacher asking me to read picture books to the other classmates. And so I think that's really when I considered myself a reader. Yeah. Yes to Sesame Street. I was a big Sesame yeah. Street kid as well. I, now I'm curious if you recall any of those picture books that your kindergarten teacher asked you to read, or do you just remember the, the moment of reading? I don't remember what titles they were. Um, I just remember reading. I was a very, very shy kid. So I hid underneath my teacher's desk most of the time reading books, um, you know, and and this was her way of getting me out from underneath her desk and sort of to join the class and participate was to ask me to read. Uh, She was a clever lady. I have this really particular moment of reading a book in elementary school. And for me, it was probably second grade. Like I could read. I don't think I was a strong reader, but it was like an early reader book in a dark, dark room. <laughs> and I, I think it stood out because it was kind of scary. It was, <laughs> I think, I think that it was like a collection of stories in a dark, dark room and other scary stories. And that Ooh. book is still in print. And, oh, you know, I'm not young anymore. It's wonderful. So. <laughs> It's a classic. (laughs) Yeah, it totally is a classic. All right. Well, let's find out what drives you and guides you in creating books for children. Oh, like I mentioned, I was a really shy kid. And I also was the only Asian American kid in my class growing up in rural Ohio. And actually in my grade, there were, you know, my brother was a couple of years older than me. There was one other Chinese American family in town and their two children were also in different grades than me. So I felt very isolated and very alone and like I didn't belong. And so I am really driven to write stories that represent Chinese American kids because I didn't see myself represented in books as a kid. We're going to go deeper on your book in just just a second. And I feel like this is a great segue because this book, Summer at Squeak, is so much about uh, Chinese culture and and identity Mm -hmm. within the Chinese culture. And I love that 
this book explores representation within the Chinese American culture. So I, I, I'm so excited to just ask all these questions that I have for you. So why don't we start with having you share with the listeners just a brief overview of what they could expect from Summer at Squee? Well, Summer at Squee is about a third generation Chinese American girl. Her name is Feeny Fong and Feeny is her nickname for Phoenix. And she has been going to a Chinese heritage summer camp in the Boston area since she was six, since the first year she could attend. And her mom and her mom's best friend, they are the co-directors of this camp. But it is Feeney's safe space. She has met so many great friends there. She has a whole group of friends she calls the squad. And they just love hanging out and doing all these Chinese cultural activities together. And in summer at Squee, it's her last summer at camp before she ages out. And she's just determined to make this like the most epic, spectacular summer ever. But she learns once she gets to camp that her squad has been uh, separated into different groups because there's been an influx of new campers and she's pretty devastated as most, you know, 12 and 13 year olds would be by something like that. And she discovers you know, that these new campers are not as into the Chinese cultural activities as she is. And she really needs to expand her sense of what it means to be Chinese American. But, you know, that makes it sound like a really, I don't know, issue heavy book. And it's it's filled with summer camp, like hijinks and pranks and activities. So on the one hand, it's very lighthearted as well. Yeah, I love it. And let's not forget that there's also maybe a first summer uh, oh, crush yes. in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the setting before we go into the characters. So the setting of Squee Camp is really vibrant and it happens to be quite transformative as well. So can you share any personal experiences or maybe some inspirations that influenced the creation of this camp environment? Because I feel as though from reading the acknowledgments at the back of your book that this was kind of a personal story in a sense. Yeah. So Squee, which stands for the Summertime Chinese Culture uh, Wellness Enrichment Experience, is based largely on a Chinese heritage camp that my sons attended. And it was it is called the New England Chinese Youth Summer Camp, N-E-C-Y-S-C. -E and, you know, because I didn't grow up with a lot of peers who looked like me, when I found out about NECYSC, -E I was really determined to send my kids there. I wanted them to have, you know, this safe space, this sense of belonging that I didn't have. And so when my oldest was six years old, I started sending him there. And one of the requirements of attending NECYSC -E is that parents serve a volunteer duty shift. So I sort of got to know some of the other parents and eventually I joined the whole organizing committee and helped organize and run the camp for a few years. And I just loved seeing how, you know, the campers were so excited to be there and how free they sort of felt. And nobody had to explain what it meant to be Chinese American. They were all just living it. Right. So and it was and still is set on a campus in the Boston area. And, you know, I also went to college in the Boston area. So the campus in Squee is sort of a mixture of a bunch of different places. I feel as though because this is it is light and fun. It's also a very multi-layered story. The topic of some Asian hate issues mm -hmm. on social media does come up. Uh, it's not like a giant part of the story, but it is it is woven in. So what else besides your experiences at this New England camp inspired you to put this story together as a whole? So I was writing this manuscript while the pandemic was going on and seeing the spike in anti-Asian violence was really disturbing. And I was really frightened, you know, like I thought, I was in a safe space, but what, you know, what I thought was a safe space no longer was. And I had friends who avoided being in certain places like the New York City subway or going out at certain times because they were also very afraid. And that definitely had an impact. And I thought, you know, I mean, camp has always been a safe space for Feeney. And what if it no longer is? So she has a number of challenges 
as she goes to camp this summer. It's no longer a safe space. She's not with her group of besties. And then there are the new campers who, um, and this is just a very mini spoiler alert, they are transracial adoptees. They're Chinese adoptees. And Feeney hasn't encountered adoptees before. And in real life, NECYSC had a number of Chinese adoptees. And it was really interesting to me to watch how they interacted with the non, their non-adopted peers. And so I wanted to sort of explore that a little bit more from the perspective of someone who grew up within the culture and sort of has to confront her own internal and biases about what it means to be Chinese American. Thanks for kind of getting vulnerable there too with this, Andrew, because I feel like it's it's really important to have these conversations and, and for everybody to hear your experience. And I love that this is an own voice story. I think it's just really important to know that, yes, you're a Chinese American author. Yes, this is a book about Chinese American characters, but this is not a book that is only for Chinese American readers. This is a book for everybody to read. So Feeney's journey at Squee is a lot about self-discovery and navigating cultural identity. I would love to know how did you approach developing her character arc and especially in the context of her interactions with the other campers? That's a great question. Any novel is an iterative process, right? And I think the more times that I revised it, the more times I got to know Feeney and uh, the other characters. So there were a number of other characters because her group of campers is 12 kids, 10 of whom are girls and and two of whom identify as boys and two counselors and two counselors in training. So there were, you know, 16 characters to manage at any one time. And Feeney's character arc, you know, it was she is a little bit like an unreliable narrator, maybe not in the strictest definition, but she has a very particular worldview. And she has grown up immersed in the Chinese culture. She's very close to both of her grandmothers. And, you know, she goes to Chinese school on the weekends. Her squad is all Chinese American girls. And she just sort of expects that everybody is like her in a way. And when the adoptees come to camp, that's really challenged for her. And she has to think about what it means to be Chinese American, perhaps having grown up in an adoptive household. And, you know, that was really eye-opening for me as an author. You know, I am not an adoptee, even though I've been around adoptees while working at camp. And, you know, we had sensitivity readers and uh, I talked to friends who study transracial adoption and Feeney's character arc was a lot in a in some ways, a lot like my own, you know, challenging my own biases about, you know, what it means to be Chinese American. Definitely, it was informed by my own experience of other people treating me as perhaps a tour guide to all things Chinese, expecting me to understand parts of the culture that I've never been exposed to or knowing the language fluently, which I don't. And, you know, asking me about, you know, really random things like philosophy, you know, Chinese philosophy, which you know, I've know very little about. So all of that sort of went into this book. Yeah, I love that you have interwoven mm. these Mandarin words and and some mm. can some little bits of Cantonese in there. And <laughs> I had to have a little bit of a, a white girl laugh at myself trying to pronounce some of the some <laughs> of the words. And I I loved that you you wove those in. And often the the words that you chose to weave into the story had a lot of a lot of meaning. Like there was a lot of purpose that went into selecting which which Chinese words or Mandarin words you you put in. I would love to know now, Feeney definitely undergoes significant growth throughout the story, which you just kind of went into. What do you hope readers, and particularly the younger readers, will take away from her transformation? I think just to approach people with curiosity rather than with assumptions and to sort of try and push back against the labels we might automatically assign to people when we see what they look like and uh, to really get to know them. Because I think that once we do get to know people on a deeper level, we find that they're more uh, like us than we might have initially thought.
Show Book Spotlight featuring Nemesis and the Vault of Lost Time. It's hard to prove the world's most important substance is missing when no one knows it's gone. Substance? What substance? asks 13-year-old Max Kellerman. Why time itself? exclaims the strange professor Max meets in the back of his uncle's bookstore. He says time is being sucked out of every living person by invisible thieves and stored away in a deep, dark netherworld. Could the professor possibly be right? Or just plain crazy? It depends on whether Max can unravel the mysterious clues in the tattered manuscript the professor leaves behind. With the help of his best friends, Derek and Samantha, Max begins a quest to find this dark realm and discover its hidden secrets. But with the time clock ticking and the professor gone missing, Max uncovers a truth he never thought possible. Max must unravel the mysteries of Nemesis to save not just his world, but the very fabric of time itself. You can find a link to author P.J. Davis's website in the show notes to learn more about Nemesis and the Vault of Lost Time. Available on Amazon today. We know the story explores themes of Chinese American identity within the summer camp setting. And I said before, I read the acknowledgements. I love reading acknowledgements in the back pages. (laughs) And so I know that from that authentic cultural representation is very important to you. So do you want to talk about the steps you took to ensure authentic cultural representation while also making the story relatable to a wider, diverse audience. So I gave Feeney this trait of really liking to sew and to do crafts. And I think that that was a way for me to not only talk about Chinese culture, because silk is from China and and China makes a lot of the world's clothing, but to also bring in fashion to appeal to all readers. And, you know, I think all readers are interested, especially in middle school, about their appearance, right? And wanting to fit in. And clothing is a is a big way that they try to do that. They also always want the trendiest, most expensive thing, right, to wear. But Feeney has a little different take on it, right? She likes to upcycle. She's always taking apart clothes and putting them together with other clothes. And she goes thrifting. And the main secondary character who is a transracial adoptee named McKenna, uh, is also very into fashion, but not from a crafting point of view. And so, you know, as they initially butt heads and get to know each other and later on become friends, the adoptees provided a way for me as an author to get across aspects of Chinese culture in kind of an organic way. Um, where readers are learning about it through the eyes of the adoptees, the different kind of activities that they do at this camp. And it was really important to me to keep it authentic. I did a lot of research. I mean, I obviously had firsthand experience going to Chinese school myself and helping run the camp with a bunch of these different activities. But I wanted to, you know, make sure that down to the type of bristles on the calligraphy brushes was absolutely correct. Like I'm not making up the type of bristles that are on there. You know, there was a lot of research involved. I know. Well, actually, before I go on to my next question, because I've mentioned the acknowledgements a couple of times, Mm -hmm. 
you also wrote that I feel like you, if I'm, I'm understanding correctly, that you sold this book to your publisher based on two sentences that were a snippet of the book summary. <laughs> like, is that right? Did I understand that correctly? So, yes, Summer at Squee is the second book in a two book deal. The first book was The Many Meanings of Melon, and I had that book mostly written um, when it sold. And I pitched Summer at Squee just sort of based on an idea that I'd been kicking around for a little while. I'd always wanted to write about my experience and my kids' experience at a Chinese heritage camp. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it was like a two sentence pitch, um, which was. I had never worked that way before. And it was definitely an interesting experience trying to uh, weave, I guess I think I called it like, you know, whole cloth out of out of that little pitch. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I feel like I could spend another 30 minutes talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I owe it all to an amazing editor. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. All right. Well, well, Feeney encounters challenges in understanding the experiences of adoptees at camp. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of touched on this a bit, but maybe you want to elaborate just a little more. How, how did you navigate the theme of inclusivity and empathy within the narrative? That was very much my intent from the beginning. I think I got caught up in something writers are often told, which is to raise the stakes that, you know, books need high stakes. And so initially I had written the new campers, the, the transracial adoptees as sort of the antagonists, right? Because they come in and in Feeney's point of view, they're messing up her whole summer. And we did not want to harm any adoptee readers. We And we didn't want to use the adoptee characters in the book in such a way, you know, like in the way that perhaps I've often feel used as a Chinese American in real life to be a cultural tour guide. I didn't want the adoptee characters in Summer at Squee to feel like tour guides for transracial adoption. Um, so for Fee, it had to be much more of an organic learning process. As I kept writing McKenna's character and the other adoptees characters and getting to know them, it really shifted for me that they to think about them not as the antagonists, but as, you know, they all have their own backstories and they all experience their adoption in different ways. And it was important for me to show that, you know, adoption is not this always this happy, wonderful, rosy thing. And and having five adoptee characters, it was, you know, I was able to show a little bit more nuance, I hope, and different perspectives. And I think that's what this book was all about, was to show different perspectives, how Chinese Americans, whether they're adopted or not, we're not a monolith. And we all have very different perspectives about things. And whether we grew up in places with many Asian Americans around or no other Asian Americans around, we've all had such different experiences. And so, you know, there's a section in the book where they sort of joke about the different ways in which they're bad Asians and they how they run counter to the, you know, stereotype of a good Asian, quote unquote. And so that was sort of fun for me to write because, yeah, there's, you know, there's no one right way to be Chinese American or you know, one right way to be whoever you are, however you identify. So yeah, absolutely. it was really, yeah, I just wanted to create empathy. I think everybody, every reader can identify with that feeling of not belonging at some point in their life. I think the, the definition I was always told as a kid of empathy is walking in the shoes of others. And to do mm -hmm. that, you need perspective. And mm -hmm. I think by having such a wide cast of characters, that's exactly what this book does. It offers pr perspective. All right. Well, themes of community and belonging are central to the book. So how do you see these themes resonating with readers, especially in today's cultural landscape? So the themes of community and belonging and how it resonates with our youth of today. I think we all need more community, right? I think we, the pandemic at first isolated us and politics has really divided us um, down to now the books that children are or are not allowed to read in schools in different parts of the country. And so I think we're all really looking for community. We're all learning how to be back in community after being in lockdown. And, you know, the, the way that the kids in the book find it is by rallying against a common cause. And that is the online trolls that they've encountered. And so 
they're building a community and they're learning to build a community by being at camp with each other. And I, I think the more time that readers spend being with each other rather than maybe on their screens, but being together in real time helps build community. And, you know, all those things that we've been talking about, empathy and inclusivity and understanding and belonging. There's, I wish I had written down this line, but there was a line that you included that really, I think, is what you're talking about. And it was about, I'm going to butcher it. So I'm sorry, but it was, <laughs> these are not Andrea's words, word for word, everybody. But that, I guess, w- one of the ways to come up against hate is by showing your joy. And oh, yeah, that is not my word. Um, or my phrase either. That is a poet um, who, let's see, her name is Draw Delicat, I believe. And she said that joy is an act of resistance. And, you know, I mean, that's what trolls want us to do. That's what terrorists want us to do is to feel fear and to, you know, divide ourselves. But, you know, if we can overcome that fear and find joy in being together, um, that is by itself an act of resistance. So that I had it, I had it completely wrong, everybody, but it was, it was in the story. It was in the story, (laughs) but yes, you know, we're talking about some deep topics because that's what I seem to do. But I think that joy is what this story actually is all about and coming together. Could you walk us through your writing process for Summer at Squee. I mean, you touched about its origin with those two sentences, but were there any particular challenges or breakthrough moments during the creation of the story? I think, yeah, I mentioned before that shifting my own perspective about who the antagonists were in the book was such a big breakthrough for me. You know, rather than having the antagonist be a person... Um, or a group of people, it was really the main character herself confronting her own biases and her own, you know, assumptions about other people. And, you know, once I sort of figured that out, thanks to my editor, I was like, oh, that makes that makes a lot of sense. But then, you know, I had to rewrite the entire book. <laughs> this book has gone through so many changes from the beginning to the end. I mean, since I wrote it during the pandemic, I really wanted and needed a lighthearted, fun book. And, it, you know, the first draft was very much a middle grade romance. You know, there were so many more scenes between Feeney and her crush Harrison. And as the book developed... And I added layers, you know, something else my editor said was that it's, it's less about the romance between Harrison and Feeney. It's sort of more about, you could say romance, but friendship romance between McKenna and Feeney. They're developing affection for each other and as friends. I I do want to comment on that. I I just found the way you wrote about this first crush just felt so healthy. Uh, You know, as a mom of three kids, two of which are girls, I would be so happy for them reading this, you know, because it's, it's okay to have crushes. It's okay to feel flirtatious. And it's really important to make sure that whoever you're crushing on is being respectful of you. And I felt like that respect level really came across. So I thank you for for doing that. (laughs) Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, I read several books about consent when this was sort of more of a middle grade romance because that was and still is something that I think I'd like to write about. And so it was really important to me that Feeney and the other girls sort of stand up for themselves, speak up for themselves and and make sure that they are respected. Yeah, so important. You've written other books Mm -hmm. like the beautiful award winning Watercress. (laughs) <laughs> the Many Meanings of Milan, as we just talked about, and Worthy. Well, Worthy's upcoming, right? Yes, Worthy yeah. will be out next year. Yeah, amazing. I would love for you to give us a glimpse into these projects and how you feel they complement the themes explored in Summer at Squee. Oh. Like, is there a thread, a common thread? Absolutely. I think they're all ultimately about identity, And they do touch upon anti-Asian racism 
And, you know, Worthy, which comes out next year, is a picture book about a Chinese American man who fought in the American Civil War in the 1860s. And the you know, racism that he encountered being one of very few Chinese people in the United States at the time. And, you know, how we are all here now and we are developing our own culture as Chinese Americans, which is very different from being, you know, Chinese having grown up in China, right? Um, Chinese American culture is is a unique thing and an evolving thing. And I think that theme of evolution kind of runs through all of my story since Watercress, right? Watercress was autobiographical and talks about sort of my grappling with my cultural heritage and learning not to be ashamed of it as a kid. And The Many Meanings of Meilan is about a Chinese American girl who moves to a small rural town in Ohio, much like the one that I grew up in. And coming from Boston Chinatown, that's a huge shock for her. And she gets renamed at school. And this profoundly affects how she thinks about herself and how important names are, you know, as a identifier, right? Um, Not just for who we are, but it has roots in our culture and our heritage. And so I think all of these books are very related on those themes. A theme that was in summer at Squee was the the cloth and the fabric and the ribbons Mm. and the kinds of threads. And you were very specific on whatever moment you were connecting with a thread on what kind of thread it was. So I'm, (laughs) I'm, because I, I, I know again from the acknowledgements that you are like Chasseau. So if you were to pick a kind of thread or fabric that would weave through all of the books, what kind of thread would it be? Wow. What a question, Bianca. (laughs) Through all of these books, maybe not a thread, but a fabric like raw silk. And you know how raw silk often has little slubs in it? It's not completely smooth. And so I think that that's like these characters and their journeys and the way they identify, right? They have their flaws. They have their obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was a great choice. And yes, I do know exactly the cloth you're talking about because I have this pink silk skirt that is uh-huh. in my closet. I bought it in my early 20s and it's beautiful. It was on a sale rack and it was still far too expensive for me, but I had to have it. It doesn't fit me anymore, but I cannot part with it. I look at this skirt and I think maybe, just maybe one of my girls is going to love mm. this as much as I did. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Yeah. It's like an integral part of you. Yeah. 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 So like that, that I love that it's uh, the roughness of those little kind of like balls that appear on the, Mm -hmm. on the silk. Anyway, I'm not a sewer. I'm not a crafter, but I loved that element of your stories. And so thank you for coming up with that answer on the spot. (laughs) (laughs) I'm amazed that I came up with anything personally, but I, I really do love to sew and I collect fabric. And so that came to mind. Can you share a highlight from the book or maybe you'd even be willing to read a favorite section? All right, let me find it. So this is just a short paragraph from a scene after bingo night at Squee, which is one of the activities they do. And their version of bingo is very unique. And um, she has tied with McKenna. Feeney has tied with McKenna and they have had to compete in a dance off for the prize. And Feeney is very clumsy. And this is like her worst nightmare come true. But she survives. And she says um, afterwards, I study the faces of the people around the table, people who are now my friends. That's the heart of Squee. Silly shared experiences like accidentally braining your counselor with a birdie or falling over while doing wobbly wushu stances or dancing completely out of rhythm to a song. It's about being together and figuring out who we are without our parents around to tell us what we're doing wrong or how we can be better. Squee is a chance to be ourselves for a brief, glorious time. Mm. 
Mm, a great, great selection. May, may I follow up and share a couple of the spots that I highlighted? Oh, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Our camp demonstrates and celebrates all the beautiful ways there are to be us, American-born Chinese, I say. Transracial Chinese adoptees, says McKenna. Immigrants, mixed race, mono or mi- multilingual, queer and questioning, and so much more. I look at McKenna. All at once and intersecting, she says. I I just wanted to share that because it is all intersecting. And and yes, this is, you know, a lot about Chinese culture being Asian American, but like that also is for everybody. Like we we are all figuring ourselves out. And if we can go back to what we talked about with the belonging and and inclusivity, and if we could all just be together and realize that we're all just figuring this out as we go each day and day, wouldn't that be so much better? So much better. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and thank you for making that point that this book is for everyone. I mean, being Chinese American definitely is a big theme of the book, but it's just one aspect or one facet of all the characters. There's so much more to every single one of them. Well, finally, what message or lasting impression do you hope that readers will carry with them after finishing Summer at Squee? So a lasting impression from Summer at Squee, I think, is just that you are fine just the way you are. And, you know, again, to just look past the labels that are assigned to you, that you assign to other people, and find the things that you have in common. So, Andrea, for me, Summer at Squee as you said, is definitely a book that helps readers of all backgrounds think more about their own preconceptions about culture and realize that there's no one right way to be a part of culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure those words were words that you wrote to me before we we had our Mm -hmm. conversation today. So thank you for writing And I want to emphasize such a joyful story. And I do just have to laugh a little bit because it's a a story set at summer camp. And the day that we are recording this is a winter storm in Colorado. (laughs) (laughs) And we're all longing for summer. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, just thank you so much for writing it. and, And thank you so much for spending time with me today and for coming on the Growing Readers podcast. Oh, this has been a wonderful conversation. I've enjoyed it so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us on this quest for growing readers. You can visit Andrea at andreayywang.com. Be sure to check out our show notes. You'll find links to order copies of Summer at Squee. And remember, if you love listening to the Growing Readers podcast, you can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you enjoy listening. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform to get new episodes as soon as they launch. If you're enjoying our book chats, please leave us a review. And while you're at it, grab your phone and text a friend you know who would love to listen to this episode. The Growing Readers Podcast is a production of the Children's Book Review. To find more books just like Andrea Wang's Summer at Squee, I hope you'll visit us at thechildrensbookreview.com. A special shout out to today's episode sponsor, PJ Davis, author of The Captivating Nemesis and the Vault of Lost Time. If you're eager to dive into Max Kellerman's thrilling adventure, remember that the book is available on Amazon today. For more updates on PJ Davis's work, don't forget to visit the author's website at pjdavisauthor.com.